Hi friends, I welcome you all to another interesting topic of inflammatory bowel disease. In last lecture, we have covered Crohn's colitis. This time, we will cover ulcerative colitis. It is a dynamic disease where remission and recurrence is very, very common. It's a dynamic disease where recurrence and exacerbations are very common. Incidence peaks during the third decade of life and again in the seventh decade of life. When differentiation between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's colitis is impossible, the patients are classified as having indeterminate colitis. It is not the colitis between Crohn's and ulcerative. When you cannot determine whether it is Crohn's or ulcerative, then it is indeterminate colitis. And it is not something in between Crohn's and ulcerative. We'll come to etiology. 15% of patients will have first degree relatives with inflammatory bowel disease. It is more common in Caucasians than Blacks or Asians. The mucosal permeability increases with the presence of inflammation. This results in passage of antigen that triggers inflammation causes an influx of neutrophils and lymphocytes. It is uncommon before 10 years. Most patients are between 20 to 40 years. Male to female ratio is equal till 40 years of age, but the incidence falls in females and remains same in males later. In pathology, the mucosa may be atropic and the Krebs abscesses are common. Now, if you remember, I have already told you in Crohn's colitis that it is a full thickness intestinal wall which will be involved in Crohn's colitis and in ulcerative colitis, it will be mucosal and submucosal disease. So again, I will stress the point, it is the mucosa which will be involved in ulcerative colitis. In long-standing ulcerative colitis, the colon may be shortened and the mucosa is replaced by scar. In silent ulcerative colitis, the colonic mucosa may appear normal both endoscopically as well as microscopically. If it affects rectum, it is called as proctitis. If it affects rectum and sigmoid colon, then it is known as proctosigmoiditis, that is proctosigmoiditis. Rectum and left colon is involved, then it is called left-sided colitis. And if rectum and entire colon is involved, it is called pancolitis. Now, did you all notice one important thing in this? Rectum is everywhere. So, this disease basically starts in rectum. And this is one more differentiating point from the Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. In Crohn's, it can affect any organ from mouth to the anal canal. Whereas, in ulcerative colitis, mainly colon is involved and in that, it starts in the rectum. Ulcerative colitis does not involve small intestine, but the terminal ileum may demonstrate inflammatory changes and then it is called as backwash ileitis. Now this is a MCQ question where they have asked backwash ileitis is common in and the options are given. A main feature of ulcerative colitis is the continuous involvement of rectum and colon. Again, do you remember I have told in Crohn's disease that these are the skip lesions which are seen in Crohn's and in ulcerative colitis, the lesions will be continuous rectum and colon. Again, a, another differentiating point. Rectal sparing or skip lesions suggest diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Now we'll come to clinical features. The severity of symptoms depends upon the degree of mucosal inflammation and the extent of colitis. Patients typically complain of bloody diarrhea and crampy abdominal pain. Proctitis may produce tenesmus. And what is tenesmus? It is crampy abdominal pain basically seen when left-sided colon as well as rectum is involved. Severe abdominal pain and fever is present in fulminant colitis and toxic megacolon. In fulminant colitis, a section of colon, usually the transverse colon, 
may become acutely dilated with the risk of perforation and it is known as toxic megacolon. As the name suggests, mega means enlarged, colon is colon. So when the colon becomes enlarged, it is called megacolon. But when it is called toxic, it is toxic when it is on the verge of perforating. Then it is called as toxic megacolon, basically seen in ulcerative colitis. Although anemia is common, massive hemorrhage is rare. On signs, physical findings are non-specific. There might be minimal abdominal tenderness and distension to frank peritonitis. The diagnosis is typically made by colonoscopy and the biopsy. Perianal abscesses and strictures are very rare and fistula and fissures are not seen. As you all have known that perianal disease is seen in right Crohn's colitis and not seen in ulcerative colitis. So of course fistula and fissures will not be a part and parcel of ulcerative colitis and perianal abscesses also will be very very rare in ulcerative colitis. When do the strictures develop? They develop when the full thickness of the intestine is involved. So in ulcerative colitis it is very rare for the full thickness to get involved. And then you should always rule out malignancy if stricture is present in ulcerative colitis. In severity, you can differentiate mild, moderate or severe. In mild ulcerative colitis, there will be rectal bleeding or diarrhea with four or fewer motions per day and the absence of systemic signs of disease. In moderate, you will have more than four motions per day but no systemic signs of illness. And in severe, there will be more than four motions per day together with one or more signs of systemic illness. That will be fever over 37.5 degrees centigrade or there might be tachycardia more than 90 beats per minute or hypoalbuminemia or weight loss more than 3 kilos. A poor prognosis is indicated by severe initial attack disease involving the whole colon and increasing age especially after 60 years. If the disease remains confined to left colon, the outlook is much better. Now we'll come to complications of severe disease. You can differentiate into acute and chronic. Acute are fulminating colitis with toxic megacolon, perforation or severe hemorrhage. In chronic, you can say as malignancy that is cancer arises from dysplastic side. There might be extra intestinal manifestation and strictures are uncommon and if seen then you have to rule out malignancy unless proved otherwise. The usual question which is asked in MCQ or the questions which are usually favorable about this topic are the complications of ulcerative colitis are 1, 2, 3, 4. And one is not a complication. So you have to just tick out what is not a complication. Now we'll come to extra intestinal manifestation. The liver is a common site where we can see fatty infiltration and cirrhosis. Fatty infiltration may be reversed by medical or surgical treatment of colonic disease. But cirrhosis is irreversible. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is a progressive disease characterized by intra and extra hepatic bile duct strictures. You can also have arthritis, sacroiliitis and ankylosing spondylitis. Skin lesions are seen like erythema nodosum, pyoderma gangrionosum or aphthous ulceration. Up to 10% of patients will develop ocular lesions which include uveitis, iritis, episcleritis and conjunctivitis. Again, a favorite question is what are the extra intestinal manifestation of ulcerative colitis? Again, options are given and one of them is not what I have mentioned in the extra intestinal manifestation. Now we'll come to investigations. First will be barium enema, which will show loss of hostration, especially in the distal colon. Mucosal changes caused by granularity, which will give rise to lead pipe appearance on barium enema. 
Remember lead pipe appearance, so hostrations are not seen. The other might be pseudo polyps which will be seen on enema. And in chronic cases, a narrow contracted colon is seen. On sigmoidoscopy, initially the mucosa is hyperemic and bleeds on touch and there might be a pus-like exudate. Later, tiny ulcers may be seen that appear to coalesce. On colonoscopy and biopsy, to establish the extent of inflammation, why we should do colonoscopy? It is basically to establish the extent of inflammation, to distinguish between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, to monitor response of the treatment, to assess long-standing cases for malignant change, and colonoscopy is not usually used in acute cases because it can aggravate the disease or it can lead to perforation. On scopy, the mucosa is frequently friable and may possess multiple inflammatory pseudopolyps. What is asked is usually if the patient comes to you with bloody diarrhea, on barium enema showing lead pipe appearance and there are pseudopolyps, the diagnosis will be ulcerative, Crohn's, CA colon and maybe diverticulitis. So it is usually and 100% you should be sure that it is ulcerative colitis. Now we will come to the treatment, medical treatment of an acute attack. Always remember in inflammatory bowel disease, medical treatment is a mainstay treatment. If the patient is not responding to medical treatment, only then you can think about patient posting for surgery. So first we will see medical treatment in details. It is sulfasalazine group that is salazopyrin. Remember this name sulfasalazine and salazopyrin because the questions usually asked is which group is the first line treatment of ulcerative colitis. So you can say sulfasalazine and which sulfasalazine is the first drug cho of choice. So it is salazopyrin. So these both names are very important. So sulfasalazine that is salazopyrin, 5 ASA and related compounds are first line agents in medical treatment of mild to moderate disease. Second line will be azathioprim and 6 mercaptopurin that is 6 MP are anti-metabolite drugs that interfere with nucleic acid synthesis and thus decrease proliferation of inflammatory cells. These agents are useful in patients who have failed salicylate therapy or who have dependent upon or refractory to corticosteroids. The onset of action of these drugs takes 6 to 12 weeks and concomitant use of corticosteroid remains always important. Corticosteroids are the most useful drugs and can be given either locally for inflammation of the rectum or systemically when the disease is more extensive. One of the 5 amino salicylic acid derivatives can be given both topically as well as systemically. Their main function is the maintaining remission rather than treating the acute attack. Now we will see the treatment of mild, moderate and severe attacks. In mild attacks, it usually responds to rectally administered steroids. In those with more extensive disease, oral prednisolone 20 to 40 mg per day is given over 3 to 4 weeks of period. In moderate attacks, these patients should be treated with oral prednisolone 40 mg per day, twice daily steroid enemas and 5 ASA. Now severe attack. In severe attack, you should always admit the patient in the ward. Why? Because you have to monitor various signs of the patient and you should be sure that whether you can conserve the patient or you have to take him for surgery. So admit the patient and then follow the following commands. First is monitor vital signs like pulse, temperature and blood pressure. Weight needs to be recorded at admission and twice a week while in the hospital. A stool chart should be kept. Increasing abdominal girth is a potential sign of megacolon developing. A plain abdominal radiograph is taken daily and inspected for dilation of transverse colon more than 5.5 cm. If there is failure 
to conservative therapy only then surgery must be considered now we'll come to indication for surgery severe or fulminating disease failing to respond to any medical therapy second is chronic disease with frequent stools urgency tenesmus and anemia third is steroid dependent disease the disease is not severe but remission cannot be maintained without substantial dose of steroid the risk of neoplastic change that is patient with severe dysplasia and you should take him for surgery if patient has extra intestinal manifestation and rarely very severe hemorrhage or stenosis causing obstruction now we'll come to the surgical treatment and it is total proctocolectomy and continent ileostomy this is a treatment of choice in chronic ulcerative colitis and it is a favorite question asked because many choices will be given and what is the choice of surgery which you will perform in ulcerative colitis so it is total proctocolectomy with continent ileostomy it has a lowest complication rate it is indicated in patients who are not candidates for restoration the patient is left with permanent ileostomy this is a disadvantage there is however a 20% long term risk of additional obstruction rectal and anal dissection procedure includes close rectal dissection then interspintoric excision of the anus which results in the smaller perineal wound and fewer healing problems restorative proctocolectomy with an ileoanal pouch that is parks operation is done in this operation a pouch is made out of ileum as a substitute for rectum and soon or stapled to the anal canal there are various pouch designs and they are j shape s shape or w shape first we'll see j shape it is most popular and the most easily made using staplers second is s shape or three loop it is associated with evacuation difficulties due to short efferent spout and third is w loop that is four loop pouch which has large reservoir which results in less bowel frequency remember all these three operations because question can be asked in any of them j s and w they can ask which is the large reservoir or they can ask what is the most popularly done surgery so all these three you have to remember then last we will come to ileostomy there are two types of ileostomy either it is end ileostomy or loop ileostomy end ileostomy can be named after brook it is patients with permanent ileostomy great attention should be paid during the operation to ensure a good functional final result loop ileostomy is often done as dysfunction a pouch ileoanal procedure resection of colon and rectum can cure the patient with ulcerative colitis but recurrence is common after resection in crohn's disease i will again tell you few differences at the end of my lecture and in inflammatory bowel disease you have to be sure whether it is crohn's or ulcerative many confusing questions are asked about crohn's and ulcerative so first point is in crohn's the full thickness of intestine is involved in ulcerative only mucosa and submucosa in involved second is in crohn's there are skip lesions which will be seen whereas in ulcerative it is continuous lesions from rectum and colon third important point is the strictures are very common in crohn's whereas in ulcerative colitis if stricture is present you have to be sure that it is not malignancy fourth is perianal disease which will be common in crohn's which is not common in ulcerative colitis so fissure and fistula is not seen in ulcerative colitis fifth and very important is rectum is always involved in ulcerative colitis and it can be involved in crohn's disease and sixth and very important last point is once you take out the affected segment in ulcerative colitis the patient can become normal and recurrence is very rare or not seen whereas in crohn's colitis even after the operation you can find recurrence in the patients i hope that you have understood these 
confusing things clearly and hope to see you soon bye